I'm delighted to welcome you all to our 17th annual Bioscience Day. Today has been a, a very exciting day with lots of lectures, lots of events, and we now come to the best part of the day, uh, which is the Eric and Joyce Young Lecture, which is about to happen. Um, Bioscience Day is a very important event on our campus. It really is a partnership between many, many different units on campus. So we all come together to celebrate the biosciences once each year. And there is a long list of people who help and contribute, and I won't read them all. But what I would like to say is that this is the ninth anniversary of the Dr. Eric and Joyce Young lecture that has been held on Bioscience Day. Now, Eric and Joyce are with us, so would you please stand up so we can recognize you? Uh, they are a wonderful couple who do a lot for our campus. Uh, Eric graduated in 1974 with a degree in biochemistry and he tells me he chose that over zoology because he was good in math. And he went on to become a very successful physician, but later on had another diversion where he went into real estate development and really made a big difference in that arena. He also served as a member of the university's board of trustees. Joyce is an accomplished nurse, and she maintains a very active interest in the life sciences. And what Eric and Joyce have done, in addition to endowing this lecture, is that they have helped the university by providing scholarships to students for international travel. They have helped people really nourish and nurture art history on campus, and these are just a few of the things they have done. And I'm particularly delighted that our young lecture today will be given by an accomplished and inspiring Nobel laureate. And to introduce Carol Greider, who comes to us from Johns Hopkins, is a former colleague of hers, Greg Ball, who came to the University of Maryland in 19, two years ago, in 2014, as the dean of uh, the Behavioral and Social Sciences College. Uh, Greg is an accomplished scientist himself. Uh, I heard a lecture from him just a few hours ago, and he works in neuroscience, he works on hormones, he works on bird song, and uh, it's been wonderful to have him as a fellow dean and as a colleague. And so let me now call upon Greg Ball to introduce Carol. Thank you, Giant. It's my pleasure and honor to, uh, to do this introduction. Uh, Professor Carol Greider uh, trained at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and did her PhD in molecular biology at the University of California, Berkeley. She did postdoctoral work at Cold Spring Harbor, where she later became a full investigator. And it was from there that she moved to the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine in 1997, where she has built her uh, career. She's now the Nathan's professor and director of the Molecular Biology and Genetics Unit, and more recently, she's received the Bloomberg Distinguished Professorship, which uh, is uh, by requirement joint among uh, uh, schools at Johns Hopkins, so she's also in the Biology Department School of Arts and Sciences. She's very well known, work, uh, known for her work on t telomeres, in particular discovery of telomerase, which started when she was a graduate student at Berkeley, and which led her on an odyssey that she has gone from studying basic cell biology, one of the fundamental prop properties of cell replication, to now concerning much whole organismal level processes like aging and cancer etiology. How I got to know Carol uh, was our daughters were in uh, lower school together, and um, so she and I uh, became acquainted at soccer fields and things like that. And in 2009, uh, she received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine to honor her work on uh, telomerase. And of course, uh, you hear that in the morning, and 
I heard that on the radio and said, oh my God, isn't that exciting? We'll have to congratulate Carol and all that. What a big day. And so I drove my daughter to the carpool line and they had a little whiteboard where they have messages of the day, announcements. And there written in marker was, Gwendolyn's mom won the Nobel Prize today. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that just summarizes how wonderful Carol is in all dimensions of her life. She is strongly committed to basic science and curiosity-driven science, even though she's at one of the finest medical schools in the country and doing clinically relevant work. She is a model for scientists to show that you can balance your life with your family. I know personally her dedication to her children as uh, we've shared our discussions together. And she's the kind of person who says, all of us, men, women, all ethnic groups, can have a balanced life and also attain scientific excellence. And she's been an ins inspiration to me in this regard, as well as to many of my colleagues. And so that's why I'm delighted to welcome here to the University of Maryland to give the lecture today. Carol, thank you for coming. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very nice introduction. It's really a pleasure to be able to come here and uh, talk to you all about um, some of our past work on telomeres and telomerase, and also um, try and uh, show you where that work uh, is going. So the topic that we're going to be uh, talking about today are telomeres, um, which are the ends of chromosomes. So um, if you look uh, within a cell here, you have all of the chromosomes. If you take one of those chromosomes uh, and bring it out here, um, most of what you hear about in uh, genetics and molecular biology, biochemistry, concerns um, all of the genes and the regulation of the genes along the length of the chromosome. But what we're going to be talking about here um, is this very end bit of the chromosome, uh, the telomere, which is named uh, for uh, telo from the Greek, uh, being end part, the end part um, of the chromosome. And telomeres play two really important functions. The first thing that they have to do is to protect the chromosome ends. So they protect the chromosome ends from things that may chew away at the ends. They protect the ends from joining with each other or from recombination. So that's one of the essential functions. Another essential function of the telomere is to be able to maintain the length of the chromosome. And we'll be talking about this um, throughout uh, the talk. So telomeres were first characterized at the molecular level. Um, when uh, Liz Blackburn worked with uh, Joe Gall. Joe is now here um, in Baltimore at the Carnegie Institution. Uh, and in 1978, uh, they identified uh, the first DNA sequence um, of telomeres uh, from the single-celled protozoan uh, tetrahymena. And the reason that they turned to tetrahymena to try and determine the DNA sequence um, of uh, chromosomes is that a single cell has 40,000 chromosomes. So if you want to understand something at the molecular level um, and do something biochemical, you go to the source where you have lots of that material. Uh, and that's why tetrahymena was instrumental in uh, identifying the DNA sequence. And what they found was that there were simple, tandemly repeated DNA at the ends of chromosomes. Um, in tetrahymena, that sequence was TTGGGG. So this is just a simple repeated sequence. It doesn't encode for anything, um, but it's uh, on the end of the chromosome to provide a buffer zone at the end of the chromosome. It turns out that that um, motif of having simple, tandemly repeated GT-rich sequences is conserved throughout eukaryotes. So organisms that have linear chromosomes have these simple tandem repeats um, on them. So, the telomere is made up of these simple tandem repeats. What's shown here is the actual sequence that's found in vertebrates, a modification or a slight variant from the uh, sequence found in tetrahymena, so T2AG3, we call this. Most of the telomere is made up of these repeats, and they are double-stranded. There's a small region at the very end of the chromosome where there's an overhang on the three prime end, um, which you'll see why that's um, important in a minute. So in addition to the DNA sequences on the ends of the chromosomes, in order to carry out these two functions of protecting the chromosome end and allowing maintenance, uh, you need to have the proteins that bind to those DNA sequences. So there are proteins that bind along the length of the double strand of the telomere. There are proteins that bind specifically to the single-stranded region. And then there are proteins that bind to those proteins. And collectively, in mammals, we call this complex 
um, of proteins that bind to the end, uh, the shelterin complex, uh, named after its uh, role in protecting uh, the chromosome end. So we've known for um, a number of years now that the way that you copy chromosomes every time a cell divides, you can't copy to the very end of the chromosome. So what's shown here is meant to represent most of that chromosomal DNA in this black box here. And what I'm highlighting are those tandem repeats at the ends of the chromosomes. And so every time the cell divides, what happens is that there are a few repeats that are lost from the end of the chromosome by the nature of how the replication machinery copies the DNA every time the cell divides. So with each round of cell division then, the chromosomes are predicted to get shorter and shorter. So how could this actually be if when we're copying our DNA every time you're losing a little bit of a repeat from the end of the chromosome? Um, so what I'll tell you is what we were able to understand about how the cell deals with this, uh, what's called the end replication problem. But as I said, the telomeres basically provide a buffer zone. This is a non-coding bit of DNA, and you can lose some of it, and there's no consequence uh, whatsoever. But what I'll be telling you about is when the telomere gets to be very, very short, then there is a consequence um, of DNA damage uh, that's uh, encountered. So how does, the, how does the cell normally deal with the fact that uh, with each round of replication, the telomeres are shortening? Um, and this is what, uh, together with Liz Blackburn, um, I was able to identify um, back in the uh, 1980s. And that is um, this enzyme that we call telomerase. So telomerase is an enzyme that contains both a protein component as well as RNA component. And what it can do is it can recognize when telomere has become shorter, and it will add these simple tandem sequence repeats back onto the ends of the chromosome. So rather than solving the end replication problem, you just allow there to be some shortening of the telomeres, and then the telomerase can elongate it so that the telomere is always maintained um, about an equilibrium. Um, so we'll be referring to this telomerase enzyme uh, throughout the talk. And this catalytic conserved protein component here is what we call TERT. That stands for telomerase reverse transcriptase because this enzyme is very uh, similar to reverse transcriptases that you may be familiar with, like from um, HIV or other retroviruses. Um, and it can use part of the essential RNA component, which is shown here in this uh, hairpin structure, that is the template region of the RNA, which contains the uh, complement to the T2AG3 repeats that are on the ends of the chromosome. And so the... Um, catalytic activity of this TERT acting on the um, RNA component, which is part of the enzyme itself, allows the addition of these telomeric repeats onto the ends of the chromosome. Um, so I won't go through uh, many years of biochemistry trying to understand how this enzyme functions, um, but what it does is to add this single strand, GT-rich strand, onto the end, and then conventional uh, polymerase can fill in the other strand, so you get net elongation of the ends of the chromosome. During cell division, most of the telomere is replicated by the conventional DNA replication machinery. The telomerase just has to add a few repeats onto a few telomeres every cell cycle to be able to keep up with the natural shortening that occurs and establish the telomere length equilibrium. So we were curious um, a number of years ago to ask the question, um, what would actually happen in the setting um, of a an animal if you can't top up those telomeres, um, and the um, telomerase is absent. So we set out to uh, generate a telomerase knockout mouse. Um, and so what we were able to do is to um, identify the RNA component of telomerase that we are calling here imaginatively TR, or telomerase RNA. And the M stands for mouse. So in the mouse, we generated a heterozygous mouse, uh, which lacked uh, one of the two copies of the telomerase RNA. And when you breed two such uh, heterozygous mice together, you get, of course, uh, the wild-type animals, the heterozygous animals, and the completely null animals. And these animals were born in normal Mendelian ratios, um, indicating that there was nothing wrong with these, what we call G1, or first-generation telomerase knockout mice. So we took these first-generation uh, knockout mice, um, and we bred them uh, to each other to generate 
the second generation telomerase knockout mice. They were also born in normal Mendelian ratios, and there was nothing wrong with them. So we continued that breeding, got the G3, the G4, G5, and the G6. I'll tell you in a minute that there are some consequences in these later generations, but let me first show you how we were able to um, follow what was happening uh, to the telomeres as these mice were bred for successive generations. So we used uh, an assay that was developed by uh, Peter Landsdorp um, in Vancouver to measure the telomere length on these chromosomes. What's shown here is a metaphase spread of mouse chromosomes with the DNA stained in blue with DAPI, and then the telomeres are hybridized with a probe that is just three of those uh, telomeric repeats. And since the mouse chromosomes are over 20 kilobases long, the number of probes that hybridize is proportional to how long the telomere is. So we can measure the signal intensity of each one of these dots to get a measure of what is the length of the telomeres in the population. And so when we do that and we look at the, the parents and then look at the different generations of breeding of these telomerase knockout mouse, uh, what we see here is these um, nice uh, frequency distributions. So what's shown here is the signal intensity, which is a measure of telomere length, versus the number of ends, uh, chromosome ends, uh, that have that intensity. So you have this nice equilibrium, and this is normally uh, what is occurring in the mice, where you have some shortening due to replication and then lengthening due to telomerase that establishes this equilibrium telomere length. However, when you don't have telomerase, and now we look at the G2 generation, the G3, sorry, the G4 and the G6, you can see that that signal intensity um, is shifting uh, to the left. So you're losing uh, telomere length with each successive round of breeding of these telomerase knockout mice. So what actually happens um, in the mice, um, the first thing that uh, we notice is that at the um, cellular level, what happens is that you start to get increasing amounts of um, either cell death, apoptosis, or in other cell types, a permanent cell cycle arrest known as cellular senescence. Um, and what that tells us is that um, we are only seeing these phenotypes in these very late generations of the telomerase knockout mouse. They're not seen in the early generations. So what that tells us is that it's the short telomeres, not the loss of telomerase, that causes this cell death. If it were the loss of telomerase, you would see that phenotype in this very first generation where you have no telomerase. And the only difference between these mice and these mice is that they've had this progressive telomere shortening. So what actually happens um, at the organismal level is we have um, a number of uh, tissues where you have loss of tissue renewal capacity. So in the testes, we see uh, germ cell apoptosis. In the intestine, you see a significant um, atrophy of the normal villi in the intestine. Uh, in the blood, there's bone marrow failure. The skin, there's decreased wound healing. And there's also premature uh, graying in these mice. And I'll have a lot more to say um, about uh, phenotypes um, as we uh, go later into the, into the talk. Um, but most of these phenotypes that we initially saw had to do with um, cell types, which are high turnover uh, cell types. So the number of divisions that they are going through um, leads those cells to um, have short telomeres and then not be able to uh, continue to renew. So why is it that a short telomere would cause cell death? Again, I'm going to summarize work from a number of different laboratories um, over the last uh, 10 or more years. Um, and what's become apparent is that the, uh, the short telomeres signal a DNA damage response. So in the normal DNA damage response, if you have double-strand DNA and you have something that causes a break in that double-stranded DNA, that broken DNA is recognized by specific proteins. And that starts off a signal transduction cascade uh, that goes through the ATM kinase, through a number of other um, uh, signal transduction uh, molecules, and then uh, P53 is activated, and the cells, depending on what cell type they are, can undergo either apoptosis or cellular senescence. So there's been a lot of work um, in this area in the DNA damage response over the last uh, 15 years. And so what we were able to uh, determine is that when you have um, a telomere, this telomere normally distinguishes a chromosome end from a double-strand break. So it says, 
I have all these telomere proteins here, I'm not a double strand break. But now, when the telomere gets to be too short, you've lost that signal, and this is recognized by proteins which also signal through ATM, all through P53, and the cells then undergo um, either apoptosis or, or cellular senescence. So that's the molecular mechanism by which uh, is, the cell death is signaled when the telomeres get to be very short. And it's what underlies the fact that we saw no effect in the first, second, third, fourth generations of telomerase knockout mice, because it's not until the telomeres get to be super short that you trigger, trigger this um, event. So why does telomerase matter? Um, so I'm going to move away now a little bit from our uh, molecular characterization and tell you some about what we've been um, able to understand how this plays a role in human disease. And then I'll circle back around at the end of the talk um, and tell you a little bit more about what we know uh, mechanistically. So we've been able uh, to learn that telomerase is absolutely essential um, for uh, two areas that contribute to human disease. The first is in normal tissue renewal. If you have tissue-specific stem cells that have to make more stem cells and also give rise to various progenitor cells, uh, telomerase is essential for the maintenance of the chromosomes during that uh, renewal process. Telomerase also plays an important role in cancer. If you have uh, specific cells which are self-renewing, and again, uh, the pluripotent uh, stem cells downstream from them, if there's a cell that undergoes a particular genetic change which drives it toward cancer, that cancer cell has to be able to solve the telomere problem and maintain its chromosome ends or it will undergo apoptosis. And so in order for that cell to go and be a tumor, it also requires telomerase. So telomerase plays a role in these two different areas, normal tissue renewal as well as cancer. And I'll take you through a little bit of the data um, for both of those. So I'll start off with the area of cancer. Um, we uh, did a number of uh, studies trying to understand the role of telomerase in cancer, and I'll show you just one to give you a flavor of the kinds of experiments um, that we did. Um, but first, let me introduce um, work from um, a number of years ago. Um, we and others um, showed very early on when we first identified uh, telomerase um, that about 85% of different kinds of human cancers have activated telomerase. And the remainder uh, use an alternative method to elongate their telomeres, which I'm happy to talk about um, after the, the talk. Um, but the main point is that um, all cancer cells have found a way to extend the length of, it, of their telomeres so that they can continue to divide indefinitely. So in order to understand um, how this may play a role um, in uh, cancer in mice, uh, we set out to use our uh, telomerase knockout mice. Uh, and this was work by a graduate student in the lab a number of years ago, David Feldzer. And what he decided to do was to focus on um, a mouse model of B-cell lymphoma. So this is um, a mouse that has um, a transgene where the MYC oncogene is driven specifically by a B-cell specific promoter, the EMU uh, promoter. So these mice have been well studied, and they all uh, get 100% incidence um, of B-cell lymphoma. So what David set out to do then was to take this transgene and cross it onto the uh, MTR heterozygous mice and then breed a line of mice where he would uh, generate the first generation telomerase null mice that also carry uh, the MYC transgene. And so, of course, in doing this, he would get this uh, MYC G1 null animal and have to cross it to another G1 null animal. Um, and you can imagine he was a very patient graduate student because this was about two and a half years of breeding before we actually got um, a result, but he had another project. Um, he's a very patient student. <laughs> so uh, he bred this line of mice, always selecting for the MYC transgene all the way down through uh, the G6. Um, and um, what David found was that the um, short telomeres uh, protected the mice against this growth of the tumor. So what's shown here is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. So this is the percent of mice alive versus the number of days. And what's shown in black is the emu mic mice on their own that are wild type for telomerase. And you can see that it starts off with 100% of the mice are alive. And then by the time uh, 100 days have elapsed, half of the mice have died, and they've all died of the B-cell lymphoma. 
If you look now at the mice which are null for telomerase, but they're G1, so they start off with long telomeres, they have a very similar survival curve. That is, uh, most of the mice are dying of B-cell lymphoma. However, when you look at the mice now that have short telomeres, because we bred them to have short telomeres, what you find is that these mice are no longer dying of B-cell lymphoma, and there's a significant uh, survival advantage here. And when David went in and looked at each one of these tick marks, uh, he went in and looked at one of these mice, what he found was that there were small microlymphomas in all of these mice. So the short telomeres don't stop the tumor from forming because the MYC oncogene is driving the tumor to form. The short telomeres stop the tumor from growing too big so that it killed the mice. So again, what this indicates is that it's the short telomeres, not the loss of telomerase, that is causing this effect. If it were the loss of telomerase, then you would have seen this effect in the first generation animals. Um, but you don't because the telomeres are still long in those first generation animals. Recently, there's been um, a lot of uh, resurgent uh, interest in the role of telomerase in cancer um, because it's been found that um, mutations in the promoter of this TERT gene, that's the protein component that's essential for telomerase activity, there's a mutation in the promoter which actually increases TERT activity. And in both sporadic melanoma as well as in familial melanoma, these uh, TERT promoter mutations are very prevalent. So in the case of families, if you inherit this uh, promoter mutation which increases telomerase, there's an increased incidence of melanoma in those families, indicating that this is a causal effect of the um, increased uh, TERT in those cells. Um, and remarkably, uh, telomerase is now the most frequently mutated gene in both melanoma as well as glioblastoma. So, so this is a very common uh, mutation in um, specific uh, types of cancer. And there's a lot of um, interest um, in this now, in telomerase again, um, because of these um, signatures of the uh, promoter mutation in telomerase. So let me turn now um, to the role of uh, telomerase in tissue renewal. I told you a little bit about what we had learned um, from our telomerase knockout mouse, um, but we really aren't characterizing that knockout mouse very much anymore because um, what we um, have now been able to uh, study is what happens um, in humans uh, when they have insufficient telomerase. Um, and this uh, came to light from a, um, a human genetic study um, where the uh, uh, geneticists were trying to understand the cause of a bone marrow failure syndrome, and what they identified were mutations um, in telomerase. And um, my colleague, Mary Armanios, who is in the oncology department um, at Hopkins, um, has been studying a number of these uh, families um, that have uh, what we're calling uh, the telomere syndromes. It was initially identified as a bone marrow failure syndrome, uh, but what Mary has been able to identify by studying these families that come into the clinic is that there are a cluster of specific phenotypes um, that occur uh, in these individuals um, that uh, leads us to call this the telomere syndrome. Example that was um, found by the, uh, the DOCAL group. Um, but what Mary found was that these families also have um, an inherited form of pulmonary fibrosis, which is a uh, lethal lung disease. Uh, predisposition to emphysema, a form of uh, cryptogenic liver cirrhosis, um, as well as uh, GI disease and enteropathy. So there's a collection of these phenotypes which are all um, caused uh, by these short telomeres. And I'm showing you this pedigree of the uh, first family that uh, had come into the Hopkins Clinic uh, because I wanted to make the point, and I think I'll make that actually on this, this next slide, um, is that these diseases are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. So what's shown here is the, uh, the grandmother of the proband that came into the Hopkins Clinic. And each one of those, these individuals which are shown here um, in black, Mary was able to show, have a mutation in the TERT protein component of telomerase. So this is now an inactivating mutation within uh, the protein. So these individuals um, actually have one mutant allele and one wild type allele of TERT. One of the things that Mary noticed, uh, as well as the DOCAL group, is that 
within a family, there's something called genetic anticipation. And what that means is that there is an earlier age of onset and a greater severity of disease with each generation in the family. Typically, this genetic anticipation, if you read about it in a genetics textbook, um, they would indicate that this is something you would see in Huntington's disease or diseases where you have triplet repeat um, expansion. In this case, this is now the second molecular mechanism, that is telomere shortening, is the second molecular mechanism um, that is known to underlie this genetic anticipation. The other thing that really struck us is that the affected people are heterozygous. At the time, uh, the docal group had found mutations in the telomeres RNA component, uh, and Mary found mutations in the TERT component. Uh, but in each case, this is inherited as an autosomal dominant fashion. So if you inherit the mutant allele, then you have a predisposition for disease. So what this suggested to us from a molecular um, mechanism is that if you have one wild type allele and one mutant allele, it may be that somehow that mutant allele is taking the wild type allele out of function. That would be a dominant negative kind of effect. An alternative is that you have one wild type allele and one mutant allele, and it's just not sufficient to have only one wild type allele. And so I'll show you that we were able to um, show that, in fact, haploinsufficiency, it's just not enough to have one copy of telomerase. You can't maintain that telomere length equilibrium over a number um, of generations. And so the way that we set out to do this was to go back to our telomerase knockout mice. And now, when we cross these heterozygous mice uh, together, we get out, as I said before, the wild type, the heterozygote, and the null animal. But now, rather than fo focusing on the animals that have no telomerase, we looked at the animals that had half the level of telomerase. And we were able to show that the heterozygotes really do have half the level of the enzyme activity. So when we take these now, heterozygous generation one, and we breed them to each other, we get heterozygous generation two, heterozygous generation three, et cetera, for a number of uh, generations, never allowing this allele to be null, but always a heterozygous state. And what we found was that there's progressive shortening of the telomeres by that same uh, assay that I showed you, um, the Qfish assay. With each generation, there's um, shortening of the telomeres, indicating that um, having half the level of telomerase isn't sufficient to be able to maintain uh, telomeres over many generations. And when we look at the mice, and again, this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, here's the percentage of mice alive versus the number of days. And if you just focus first on the wild-type animals, that's shown here in black. And when we look down at the heterozygous generation 10 animals, you can see there's a significant decrease uh, survival. Uh, so these animals uh, typically uh, die from complications of both um, immune deficiency as well as the GI uh, disease, um, that, uh, the uh, villus atrophy that's seen in these mice. So this indicates that the inheritance of short telomeres decreases survival because what's happening across these generations is that those short telomeres are going from one generation to the next to the next, and now you have a decreased survival which is very similar to the genetic anticipation that's seen uh, in the human telomere syndrome families. So uh, my colleagues and I had shown um, back in the uh, 1990s um, that uh, remarkably um, in humans, um, if you look uh, with age, that there is uh, telomere shortening uh, with age in normal human uh, cells. So this is an example um, of a study uh, where the uh, mean, that's the mean telomere length, is plotted here, and the age of the donor, and this is from white blood cells. So there's a progressive decline in the telomere length um, with age in humans in white blood cells. At first, we thought that may be that the telomerase isn't active in these white blood cells, but now what we know is that there is the ability to express telomerase activity. However, because telomerase is so limiting, recall that having even just half the level causes telomere shortening. The number of cell divisions that occur in this white blood cell lineage outstrips the ability of telomerase to keep up and um, elongate all of the telomeres. And that's probably the reason uh, for this uh, progressive telomere shortening um, with age. Now, I already told you that um, for most of the cases, the telomere is a buffer zone. You can lose a lot of that telomeric sequence. And it isn't until the telomeres get to be very short 
that there's any consequence. This is what we learned from our mouse studies um, as well as uh, studies in yeast. So uh, this is one um, example of this telomere shortening with age, um, but this was reproduced by um, another group, and um, I'm showing you this uh, uh, paper from The Lancet um, to make the point. If you look in the normal human population, again, looking at telomere length with age, you see this decline in telomere length with age, and this has been reproduced now by many different groups, but the normal distribution in the population has a very wide distribution. Um, there have been some uh, things written uh, in, the, in the popular press over the 10 years that uh, telomeres could somehow uh, determine you know, how old you are. And you know, somebody once called me up and said, you know, I have this bird, can you tell me how old is it from the telomere length? And you probably would know more about the bird than I would. But I just want to pose this as a question to you. If I gave you a sample of DNA and you determined that it was 7.5 kb telomere length, that person or bird could be 10 years old or could be 70 years old. So yes, there is shortening of telomere with age, but since there's such a wide distribution, you can't tell anything determinatively about that uh, telomere length. But it's very important because, as I told you, there are these uh, families that have these inherited syndromes with their short telomeres. And I've tried to make the point that it's the telomere length, not the status of telomeres, that matters. So those individuals who have the shortest telomere in the population are actually at risk for these same diseases that we see in the families that have the inherited syndromes. Um, so in order to understand this and to study these families, which are now uh, being referred um, really from all over the world to um, Mary's Clinic um, at Hopkins, we again used um, an assay that was developed um, by Peter Lansdorp, and we were able to reproduce that clinical assay um, as a CLIA-approved um, assay that um, is at, at Johns Hopkins. So what um, Peter had uh, initially done is to um, develop a very uh, reliable assay that is based on fluorescence in situ hybridization, as I had shown you, and determine the confidence intervals and, uh, in the population and look at the 99th percentile long telomeres in the population or the first percentile of the short telomeres in the population. Um, and in his case, uh, they looked at uh, 450 uh, normal individuals. And at Hopkins, we've now reproduced this with 200 individuals. And what's shown here is the confidence intervals, um, uh, which are uh, fit to a mathematical model. So you can determine if you measure somebody's telomere length um, where that age-adjusted telomere length um, falls. So, as I said, Mary has been uh, uh, really um, has a referral at, at Johns Hopkins into her, her telomere clinic, um, and those patients uh, that come in, um, you can see the telomere length is um, below or near uh, the first percentile for those, these are the affected individuals within the families. The unaffected family members are, as you would expect, all over the normal um, distribution um, here. But this then um, allows her to very carefully phenotype uh, the consequences of the short telomeres um, in, uh, in humans. And so she's learning um, uh, daily about um, any of the new effects that we might not have anticipated would occur with uh, telomere shortening. Mary's lab, as well as a number of labs um, across the, the globe, um, have identified uh, 13 genes um, that can explain uh, these telomere shortening syndromes. So when a patient comes into the clinic and you show that they have short telomeres, you immediately sequence these 13 known genes. So the 13 known genes are either the components of telomerase, the holoenzyme, so here's shown the TERT component, the TR component, this sheltering complex that I told you the telomerase has to interact with, as well as genes that process the telomerase RNA uh, and genes that are involved in uh, making the other strand um, of the telomere. So each one of these colored genes here um, is known to be uh, mutated in families that have this telomere shortening. But the really remarkable thing is that when these uh, patients come into the clinic and have a family history of short telomeres, only 50% of the time is it any of those 13 genes. So what that tells us is that there could be potentially another 13 genes out there which contribute to telomere-mediated disease in the human population that we don't yet know what they are. So um, having studied telomeres now for about 35 years, it's really quite remarkable to me um, that we could um, have so much still to learn about what causes the telomere shortening um, in these human populations. So we're really 
going back to work now to further um, hone in on this mechanism of how it is that telomere length equilibrium is normally maintained. Um, because understanding um, this normal maintenance of telomere length regulation should point us to um, the genes that may be mutant um, in these, these families. So as I told you, there's a sheltering uh, complex at the ends um, of the chromosome. And the telomerase enzyme has to somehow interact with that to establish this telomere length equilibrium. So if you have a telomere length, how many ends have a particular length, and this is their length, the natural DNA replication will cause telomere shortening, and then the telomerase should elongate it. But we find in um, normal mammalian cells, as well as all of the model systems that are, are known out there, and we also spend a lot of time studying uh, the yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, in all cases, you have this normal equilibrium length that is maintained. So how is it that telomerase getting onto a telomere establishes this nice equilibrium? How come telomerase doesn't get on and just make a whole bunch of repeats, and then you end up with very, very long telomeres? That's not what occurs. So we really think that there are two fundamental things that can be regulated. The first is the frequency with which telomerase will get on and elongate telomere. And the second is, once it gets on, how much does it make? So we really want to be able to understand those parameters to be able to really um, molecularly define what this telomere length equilibrium is. So the assay in human cells for um, looking at uh, things that change telomere length, the classical assay is this southern blot. So this is an example of a human telomeric DNA um, probed on a southern blot, and you see this distribution of telomere lengths. That's that frequency that I was uh, telling you about. And when telomerase isn't expressed, for increasing number of population doublings, these are the population doublings that this culture has gone through, you see this progressive shortening of the telomere. So that's visually um, very characteristic. However, that 88 population doublings is about eight months of cell culture. Um, and we want some way to look at uh, telomerase regulation that doesn't take eight months in order to see the, uh, the changes. Uh, so Stella Lee, who was a um, graduate student in my lab who recently graduated, uh, developed this new assay um, that we call the ADDIT assay. It stands for Addition of De Novo Initiated Telomeres um, to Measure Telomere Elongation. And she um, took uh, uh, parts of experiments from a variety of different um, groups um, and was able to come up with this way to rapidly measure uh, telomere elongation. So she engineered a mouse chromosome, and she put in a hygromycin resistance gene. And next to that, there are tandem repeats of this telomere sequence, which we call the seed sequence. And then there's an um, endonuclease uh, cut site. This is what's something called a meganuclease, which recognizes a 13 base uh, recognition uh, sequence. And so in this cell line, you can induce this endonuclease, ISCE1, with doxycycline, and it will cut the chromosome in vivo. And then telomerase will go and add telomeric repeats onto the end of that. And by knocking down genes or adding inhibitors or, or drugs, you can see whether or not you can change that. And you can do this in one cell cycle, so in 24 hours rather than in eight months. So I'll show you um, a little bit about how this works. So Stella was able to adapt um, an, a method uh, that was uh, initially used by uh, Duncan Baird's group, where they found a way to take a telomere and ligate on a specific sequence um, as an adapter onto the end of the telomere. And then you can use that adapter and sequences within the hygromycin gene and do a PCR. Um, and that will determine then the length of that telomere by that PCR product. So in order to see whether or not we could measure telomerase activity, Stella did this in either a telomerase positive cell line, or we generated from our telomerase knockout mouse cell lines that were telomerase negative. Or as a control, she just took genomic DNA and cut it in vitro in the test tube with ISCE1, ligated on an adapter, and then did the PCR. So let me just uh, focus here on, um, on this F2 primer, just to go through one example. So this would be now a PCR between uh, this region and the hygromycin and this uh, 
TLRET adapter that was added. If you look at the control lane here, which is the in vitro cut material, this is the size of the PCR product that you would predict just below 2 kb that you get uh, from PCR of this initial seed sequence. In the telomerase positive cell line, what you see is you have things that are above that length. And in the telomerase negative cell line, you see primarily things that are below that length. So this is the kind of uh, readout that we had to uh, determine, is telomerase actually elongating that seed sequence? So if I could just take a minute here and ask, has anyone in the room done PCR? Has anyone in the room had a PCR artifact happen? Yeah, probably more of you than have actually done PCR, right? <laughs> so we, we were ex really excited by this assay, but it's not really that exciting looking at this little blur on a PCR product. So what we decided to do uh, was to use um, a sequencing method to look at what the length of those products are and the sequence of the products. And we turned to PAC biosequencing, which is a method that does a long read. So typically, the sequencing that you may do, um, Illumina sequencing, um, will read, have read lengths of about 100 base pairs. And of course, that would not help to read out 100 base pairs, because you would just get all of these little tiny sequences. But the PAC biosequencing will start at one end and sequence all the way through on a single molecule to the other end. Um, and so we um, subjected these PCR products to the PAC biosequencing. So what's shown here is, again, the cartoon of the hygromycin with the seed sequence um, and this control um, that we've ligated on here. And so each one of these little lines, there are hundreds and hundreds of little lines going across here. Each one of those is a sequencing read from the PAC biosequencing. And we've color coded it where the hygromycin here, everything is aligned here at the border between the hygromycin and the uh, telomere sequence. Um, and each one of these reads, the telomeric sequence, is shown in uh, the perfect match is shown in the lighter color of orange, and an imperfect match is shown in a darker color of orange. PAC biosequencing is notorious for having about a 15% error rate, but we don't care because we don't really want to know what the sequence is. We want to know what the length is. We want to use this sequence as a ruler to determine how long the products are. Um, and so you'll see also PAC biosequencing generates what's called um, indels, insertions and deletions. So some of these products are slightly longer than others because of the error rate in the PAC biosequencing. Uh, but in general, what we see here is that here we have the ISCE1 uh, site. And um, the products that we are sequencing have to uh, include the hygromycin and uh, this uh, adapter that was added on to the end so that we don't uh, sequence things where the polymerase just fell off. So in the telomerase negative, um, you get uh, these products here, which I will um, go through. Um, but the first thing I want to show you is that in the telomerase positive cells, um, you have this class of um, products where you have this ISCE1, this 13 base unique sequence, and you have telomere sequences past the ISCE1 site. So when you blow that up, what you see is you have these telomeric sequences coming in, and now you have this unique site, this ISCE1 cut site, and then telomeric sequences on the other side. And what that indicates to us is that those must be the chromosomes that had de novo addition of telomerase. We can be very confident that those were uh, de novo addition uh, by telomerase. And if we go back here, none of these reads that are slightly longer in the telomerase negative cells have that signature of having the ISCE1 and then telomeric sequence beyond it. This long product could potentially be due to PCR slippage during either the sequencing or the, the PCR step. So what we quantitate here is uh, the percent of the chromosome ends that have extension beyond the ISCE1 site. So that's our, our criteria. So now we can do several things. We can look at things that might perturb telomere length. Uh, we can also look at essential genes, because this is done for a single cell cycle. So anything that may um, kill the cell, that's OK. That's not a problem. Uh, we can uh, assay the role of essential genes for uh, telomere elongation. So what Stella decided to first look at um, was the role um, of ATM. And as I told you earlier, um, the, in double-strand breaks, uh, ATM, if you have a double-strand break, ATM will be one of the early things that transduces um, a signal. And what the ATM signal does at a double-strand strand break is um, allow cell cycle arrest. It could be a permanent cell cycle arrest, cell death, 
or it can pause the cell cycle to allow repair of that DNA damage. In the case of short telomeres, we knew that the short telomeres signal through ATM, and they can cause a cell cycle arrest or cell death, but we wondered if there was this other pathway that may uh, be present that we didn't know anything about. Now, the role of ATM in human telomere elongation has been somewhat controversial. It's been known for um, a number of years that the yeast homologue of ATM, which is called TEL1, has short telomeres and has been shown to regulate telomere length. Um, in mice, there was no evidence for ATM in telomere elongation, and a number of papers in human cells, some said ATM is involved, and others said ATM was not involved. So we thought that we would use this Abbott assay to examine the role of ATM in telomere elongation. So what Stella found uh, in her uh, control samples, she saw about 25% uh, of the telomeres were elongated past the ISCE1 site. And when she either used a drug that would knock down ATM, and she did the controls to show that the drug was actually knocking down ATM activity, or siRNA against ATM, she found a significant reduction in the um, elongation, indicating that ATM plays a role in telomere elongation. The problem was, of course, we have here a new assay and a new result, so we can't use the new assay to determine the new result until we know that the assay is, uh, is important. So um, what she then did was a couple of experiments. I'll show you just one experiment that she did to look at the role of ATM with a more conventional assay. Um, and that was she took cells and um, infected with a lentivirus that overexpresses both components of telomerase, um, and then measured telomere length at day two or day five, either with or without the ATM um, inhibitor drug. Um, and what this looks like on the conventional southern blot is you have um, telomere lengths here, um, this nice equilibrium distribution. And then when you add this overexpressing virus, you see that the telomeres get significantly longer in a short period of time. However, if you do this in the presence of this drug, which is inhibiting ATM, you block that elongation. So it was another way of showing the role of ATM um, and also helping uh, to validate our assay. So we can use this assay now uh, to get at some of the um, important regulators that are playing a role um, in telomere length. Sorry, this is just what I showed you already. So um, I've told you two stories. I've told you the story about telomerase playing a role um, being required for the growth of cancer cells. So if telomeres are maintained continuously, um, then there's this risk of cancer, um, and uh, familial inheritance of too much telomerase actually predisposes to cancer. In the case of telomeres getting too short, you have stem cell failure, and again, the genetics show that familial um, inheritance of too little telomerase causes uh, this stem cell failure. So again, there's an important equilibrium um, here, and as we heard uh, and talked earlier today, it's like the Goldilocks um, effect. Um, you have to have just the right maintenance of the telomere length equilibrium. Um, and that's why the equilibrium is so important, because you can't be too long or too short, um, or uh, there's risk for disease. So in summary, I've told you that short telomeres signal cell death or senescence after many cell divisions. Short telomeres can limit the growth of cancer cells. Short telomeres cause a spectrum of degenerative diseases that we collectively call the telomere syndromes. The added assay provides a powerful new tool to rapidly assess telomere elongation, and I showed you that ATM is required for telomere elongation. And finally, I'd just like to bring this back around and to say that new discoveries often come from unlikely places. We didn't set out to understand the role of short telomeres in bone marrow failure or in pulmonary fibrosis. Instead, we were just curious about how it is that telomeres are maintained, um, and both telomeres and telomeres were identified in this single-celled protozoan, really just based on curiosity-driven research. And then by continuing to follow our curiosity and follow up those leads and how they play a role in disease, we came to the really remarkable, unexpected uh, discovery that the telomeres underlie um, these uh, inherited uh, human syndromes um, that are also uh, very similar to age-related uh, degenerative disease. So curiosity-driven research provides unexpected discoveries that can have important implication for human health.
And I just want to uh, thank um, all of the members of the uh, Grider Lab, as well as our collaborators in the Armanios Lab. And a number of these experiments were done by, by past members. So thank you very much. So the, the question is about plant telomerase. Yes, the uh, plant telomerase, uh, the TERT component, has very similar um, sequence to the um, mammalian uh, telomerase. So it hasn't been identified, and a telomerase knockout plant. So most of this is done in um, Arabidopsis. Um, and it's quite remarkable. You can see generation one, generation two, generation three, and the plants get smaller and sicker and smaller and sicker, and then the line dies out. So it's just as essential in plants um, as it is in, in mammalian cells. Yeah, so about 15% um, about um, of human cancers um, have a, a mechanism that in, in the mammalian field is called ALT, for alternative lengthening of telomeres. But we had been studying this in yeast, we and others, for a number of years. It's basically a gene conversion kind of mechanism. So what you have is you have a short telomere and a long telomere. And when that short telomere becomes too short, it no longer functions as a telomere, so it can now actually invade the long telomere and copy off it in a classic gene conversion mechanism using DNA polymerase. So at the, at the end of that, you end up with a long telomere and a long telomere. So we get net elongation of um, both telomeres. It's, it's, people sometimes describe it as a recombination process, but it's not reciprocal recombination because that wouldn't get you anywhere. It has to be a gene conversion kind of mechanism. And the mechanism is very well worked out um, in yeast, what the genes are for recombination uh, to allow that. And it's very clear that this is a, a method that is activated in those cancers that don't have the telomerase activated. Well, this has to do with age-related degenerative disease, right? So um, telomeres are not the thing that limits total longevity, um, and we know that because we can um, look at mice. There are some mice that have about 10 kb telomeres and other mice that have about 100 kb telomeres, and the lifespan of the mouse is not different. And if you follow the aging field, there are um, many different mechanisms that people are studying in the aging field. There's uh, hormonal pathways and oxidative stress pathways and a variety of other kinds of pathways. So um, if you imagine, let's just guess, that there are 10 different things that impinge on maximum lifespan, telomeres play a role in a number of these diseases. So they're one of those things. But if you just change one of those things, you're not going to change the maximum lifespan. Um, and so telomeres do not determine human longevity, but they play a major role in the diseases that you may get up. So we call that the health span. So um, if we can um, affect the telomere-mediated shortening and find a way to elongate the telomeres in those patients, then we should be able to alleviate the disease and increase their health span so they can reach the normal um, uh, expectancy. So the question is about different lengths um, in different tissues. Um, so some of those experiments have been done um, in human and also um, in mouse cells. And there are, um, if you measure, for instance, on a southern blot, specific tissues will have specific uh, telomere lengths. But of course, you recall there's also a different replicative history of each one. If you just take a tissue, that tissue may have gone through more rounds of cell division than another tissue, and you don't know when telomerase was turned on or off. So um, it's not yet clear if there's a different rate of shortening in different tissues, or if um, there's a different sensitivity to how short the telomere gets. Um, most of what's now studied in these clinical samples where you have um, the, the patients that have a familial um, inheritance of short telomeres, where we can 
know genetically what the cause is because you can follow the gene in the family and know who has it. Um, that's all done um, on these blood cells because the most sensitive assay is this um, fluorescence and C2 hybridization assay um, that gives you the best uh, reliable clinical results. Um, so now almost all of the studies in those patients are done in blood cells. So telomerase elongates the telomere in very late S phase, and that's conserved across all organisms where it has been studied. And in another conversation we could have um, offline, um, I have a, a specific molecular mechanism for why I think it's, a, it's occurring in late S phase that actually links the act of DNA replication directly and mechanistically with telomere elongation. I just published it as a, as a review article. I'm happy to, to talk about that. So I, I think it's not uh, a coincidence that it elongates telomeres in, in S phase. I think it's actually traveling with a replication fork and then elongating the, the telomere at the end of the, of the chromosome. Carol, this seems like a really appealing target for a general cancer therapy. Are, are there prospects? I mean, you, you know, when you think about it, almost every cancer could potentially be attenuated uh, right. through this mechanism. Are there ideas coming up that might, might do this? So when we started off with the telomerase knockout mouse, the first thing that we looked at was this cancer question. That's why I told the cancer story um, first. And there was a lot of excitement about a telomerase inhibitor. Um, and so there were companies that started looking at telomerase inhibitors, and we talked to some of them. And um, now that we also know that there is this other side of um, having sh telomeres that are too short, you would want to be very careful about who you would to give a telomerase inhibitor to. I still think that you could save lives on both sides, but you have to be very um, careful, and this is where the whole you know, individualized medicine, precision, precision medicine, medicine yeah. comes in, is that you know, if somebody were uh, at that first percentile for telomere length, you might wonder about the efficacy of a telomerase inhibitor. That being said, there were a number of companies that set out to make telomerase inhibitors. Only one of them, this company, Geron, got to clinical trials. Several of their clinical trials um, failed. It's not clear yet you know, what's happening going forward. But so far, what's been released publicly is there's just one compound that people have put into clinical trials. And you would think that people would be developing other compounds to go into clinical trials. So I do think it's still um, a, a very good target for cancer. But now that we know and have a way to measure the side effects, one could do that in a more uh, nuanced way and stratify patients um, appropriately. Yes, Claire. Hi. Um, so your study in the human population is for, for people that were heterogeneous, more than each one was like heterozygous. Yeah. Heterozygous, mm -hmm. So we would argue that the individuals that are heterozygous, that these are premature aging syndromes. All of these um, things, the uh, pulmonary fibrosis, bone marrow failure, there's also uh, decreased um, uh, immune function. Um, so uh, these are all uh, what we would normally call age-related degenerative diseases. So it is a premature aging syndrome. The individuals who um, <clears throat> have been identified that actually are homozygous, um, they die very early and have very severe short telomeres. So usually in the first year of life. Thank you. Well, let's all give Carol another round of applause.